Hey everyone, Troy Hammond here, and that means you're watching the We Fucking Love Startups podcast. And so today's episode is a treat. We are chatting with Mike Carden. Mike is the co-founder and co-CEO of Joyous. Uh, he was previously the founder of Sonar 6. He's been on a lot of boards. He's been in the industry a long time, and the guy is very smart. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. It's not often that you get to sit down and talk to someone with such integrity and experience and just general nice guy in the industry who gives his reckons, gives his thoughts, sends the elevator back down to share that information. And so I think you're really going to enjoy it with this one. I just want to say thank you to everyone that's been watching this season. The podcast has really blown up. We've got so many followers, so many subscribers. We've got so many people now sharing it around and sitting, like sending it to new audience as well. So thank you to everyone. I hope you've enjoyed them as much as Jono and I have. And so until next time, enjoy this episode. Kia ora. Thanks for tuning in to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast, brought to you by Talent Army. Oh, mate, well, you're not doing things by halves. We're founding companies, getting married, going on honeymoons, you know, it's all happening for you. Um, so for those people listening that don't know who you are, this is the first time they've sort of been exposed to you, like how would you describe yourself and your sort of elevator pitch of what Joyous is? Yeah, look, I, I guess that I'm what they'd class as a kind of serial entrepreneur these, yep. these days, right? Um, yeah, founded a SaaS business uh, in 2006 when SaaS was new called Sonar 6 and that was um, yeah, that was a, 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 a real big learning curve and did yep. that for um, five or six years and that was acquired by a company called Cornerstone On Demand. So I went from a scrappy New Zealand startup to being part of the leadership group of a, yep. a NASDAQ-listed you know, SaaS company. Um, yeah, came out of that probably in 2000 and. 14, I think, and like um, by that point, it was like, okay, I want to do something new um, and spent a little bit of time working with some other companies, you know, and, and investing in a few things and getting involved in a few things and eventually said, oh, look, let's let's get back into enterprise software. And, um, you know, that was, I guess, five years ago now um, yeah. and, and we formed Joyous and I formed it with my brother yeah. um, and um, my brother, Philip, and we really went out there to, to, to look for a, look for a, a, a kind of, Good purposeful problem, really, and something which you could kind of apply the, the advances in enterprise tech to. Um, yeah. And yeah, came up with this idea of of um, you know, of trying to unlock the expertise in large workforces. Um, yeah. you know? So if you if you have a problem that you're trying to solve in your business, something you're trying to improve, yeah, you know, whether that's I don't know, improving up improving the speed of patient patient discharge in a hospital, or or um, you know fixing you know common challenges with fiber installs and houses or something why don't you start by asking the people doing the work you know, go out to those large you know, workforces and and say hey what would you do and then you know basically look at all of that data and start to sort of find ways you could fix things um you know and so i guess it was just based on this idea that the expertise to solve your problems is sort of locked six or seven layers down in your business and i'm um, Oh man, it's a rocket ship, right? It's yeah. just been a it's been a real ride. That idea has really resonated. You know, there's not a there's not a single kind of person you talk to um, in a in a large org that doesn't just immediately get that. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like that whole frontline success category is blowing up right now. Like yeah. companies are starting to realize the power of talking to people. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of it's kind of bonkers, isn't it? Like you know, like it's um, yeah. I I I always just sort of think that some you, you are customers are a little some of the largest companies in the world, right? And just, um, you know, everyone innately understands that the front line knows how to, 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 to improve things, to improve mm. the experience of customers or improve the experience of patients. They know how to, you know, to, to, to save costs and do things more efficiently. Um, but they're just sort of locked out of that conversation sometimes and that's just often been structural. And, of course, the way that, um, you know, software changes and, and, and opens up and so on, it sort of allows you to do that, right? Yeah. It allows you to kind of actually get that conversation going at scale and, and yeah, not just sort of do some surveys or something, actually ask people, you know, properly engage them in conversation, you know, you say, what would you do to fix this? Oh, that's interesting. Could you tell me more? You know, really build that kind of, uh, uh, you know, that, that piece where not only are you asking people to do, you're asking the people who do the work what they yeah. do, but you're also then kind of solving together. Yeah. Um, you know, and and then finally, you've got just this whole new world of really great AI now to actually help you really 
you know, extract stuff at scale as well. So mm. it doesn't matter if you're dealing with a workforce of 20,000, 30,000, 60,000 people, you can kind of actually ask them all and, and do that in a conversational fashion. Yeah. So you, you mentioned uh, like blowing out like a rocket ship, right? Mm. And do you think that's because you've had that experience with Sonar 6 and you were able to make some different decisions, better strategy second time around? Yeah, look, I, mean, I would say it's pretty simple. Just what's happened is that second time round, we've been able to um, you build a, a better team faster, you know, partly because we had more capital, partly because like we were able to attract people in because um, you know, I guess you've got more confidence and more, more track record. And what that's meant is that you know, folk have joined us um, you know, early in the journey, like um, you know, Lisa and Ruby and Kevin and others. I mean, there's many, many of them yeah. um, who are just probably uh, – a category of, of quality of contributors above what we maybe had at the start of Sonar 6. And so yeah. that's really, I mean, it's that simple. It just kind of comes down to having good people, possibly being able to identify what good people look like yeah. more and then certainly being in a mode where you can probably um, you know, help them uh, you know, achieve and deliver a bit more because you've just had a bit more experience in it. I mean, certainly at the beginning of Sonar 6, we were, I mean, it was just, you know, myself and a couple of guys I, I knew from from riding bikes, and you know, we were trying to build a SaaS company. Um, we didn't even know what a SaaS company was, right? There was mm. a lot of stuff there where I, I guess we probably weren't naturally inspirational. <laughs> yeah, it did well though, man. Like Sonar Six yeah. went global fast. Though, yeah, right? I mean, it was it was it was a good ride too. I mean, like like they're very different eras. Though. It's the thing is like um yeah that era was very um it was hard to get capital, yeah. so we were yeah we were super scrappy because of that um. Which is cool. Um, you know, I think that um, you know personally, I, yeah, I like had a mortgage and babies, and you just had to make something work. So there yeah. was a real, like, real solid. So the drivers were very, very, um, very solid um, at a personal level. But then also that era of of the beginning of SaaS, you know, enterprise software was just I'm going to take an on premise process or piece of software, I'm going to put it in the cloud. Yeah, and so you know, Zero is putting accounting in the cloud, or Salesforce is putting CRM in the cloud. All yeah. we were doing at Sonar Six was taking performance reviews, mm. which every company did. They all kind of sucked, and we were putting them in the cloud. And yeah, you know, we, we you know, I, I've, I've said this to lots of people. Like the 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 big important decision in Sonar Six is just picking off something at the start, which is a big problem, a big pain point, yeah. massive market, yeah, billions and billions of dollars. Yeah, we, we, we worked out the TAM was $30 billion. Even if you're just like unsuccessful, you've still made, yeah, you still get to $5 million, $10 million of mm. revenue. Wow, wow. And then so was it more strategic around the second time, around the market that you were going after? Oh, look, I think that there was there was two two or three things driving it, right? I think that the one thing was that yeah, we certainly wanted to, to do something which had some level of purpose. I think that yeah. like that, you know, if, you, if you're the sort of person or group of people where things you do become successful, you should think quite carefully about what you do because yeah. you want to start impacting things which might make a difference. And so for us, this idea of fundamentally trying to make work better for people. Was it was it more of an HR lens initially when you started Joyous I, or was that uh, my misconception? Yeah, no, it's not a misconception. I think we did have that lens because we were like like I said, we were really focused on this idea of making life better for people at work. Yeah, you know, and which we still are. Yeah. But um but we, we sort of had a a view then of, I guess, employee experience, which just wasn't very nuanced. We had yeah. probably an HR view of that, which is that employee experience is a collection of of you know, these these sort of HR terms like um you know like well being or D E and I or culture. Now these are super important things and so they were super important to us at the beginning of that. But when we actually started to, to learn about people's real experience of work, you know, um I was talking about fiber installs just briefly before. Yeah. You know, if you're installing a fiber box in the home and you you know, you park your van, you go up the stairs to the apartment, you knock on the door, you know, you go, you've got the wrong screws. I gotta go back down the stairs. I, you know, I, I needed jib board screws, but I've got wood screws. I, I fiddle around the van. I don't have them now. I gotta drive somewhere to get them. I gotta go back up. I gotta harass the customer again. Now mm. I'm doing the job. Yeah, that's actually your experience of work. Yeah. So if we can kind of improve that, that operational stuff of going, oh, well, maybe you know, I know just, if this problem's common, we should bundle both kinds of screws as a very, very simple, for instance. Yeah. But that's the sort of thing that's actually the stuff that, like, when you go home at night to your partner or spouse, those are the parts of work you talk about. You don't talk about, you know, those other topics I mentioned before, which are more HR topics. And so we, we probably shifted our focus um, away from uh, – 
you, you know, this employee experience lens, yeah. which was very really HR driven to one, which is much more practical. Um, but and we became much and more personal, operational. right? So because yeah. it's personal to the person because it feels pertinent versus yeah. a, you know, airy fairy turn yeah. across the business. Yeah, it's completely correct. And and ultimately too, we're, you, you know, like we're in a, it was a good decision because we're in a more recessionary economy now and, you know, HR is quite discretionary stuff actually. It's quite discretionary mm. spend often. And so, you know, whereas we're selling to you know, operational folk that are going, okay, if we do this, not only are we going to imp- improve the experience of employees, which is good for retention and all those sorts of metrics um, and you know, ultimately the right thing to do, but also we're going to save money. You know, we're saving, yeah. we've saved one trip up and down the stairs. You know, if you add that up, you know, like, you know, we're going to save ourselves, you know, X many dollars a year. And in our largest clients, every time they run a joyous campaign, they save six, seven million dollars a year. And they'll run, you know, in some of these big telcos, they'll run 40 campaigns a year. Well, right? well, you must, have, yeah, must have some great testimonials. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are, we are absolutely, you know, we're building a business. We, this is our vibe. We're trying to build it based around customer impact so that the, the center of everything we do is the impact we creating customers mm. and that impacts not just impact for the for the bottom line often it is but you know, we want to make sure we're impacting you know things which are good for employees things which are good for the unions like you know, we're trying to impact everything positively there and then really just tell those stories yeah. so we're not building some big sales engine you know factory marketing approach we're really just trying to make those stories visible so that you know, those those testimonials those that referenceability is there and that's how we grow yeah, awesome. Hey, so you're you're another business that has the three EO model, I see, right? And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That seems to be popular these days. You're the mm. third podcast. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wow. Sharesies yeah. um, and a few others that I've been working with recently. Yeah. What talk me through the decision making on that for a start? Yeah, like I mean, look, look like everything. It's easy to kind of post rationalize and tell you how we had some some grand plan, but initially, um, you know, Joyous was founded by Philip and myself, and we're brothers, and so yeah. it was like just to save fights, you know, like why don't we just both be CEO? But actually, interestingly enough, it had some benefits we found you know, in those very early days. And one of the biggest benefits was that it was um, it was a good way of dissipating stress, actually. So like, um, you know. Sharing the stress. Yeah, sharing the stress. You go and you've got a, you've got a problem, you go and tell, yeah. in this case, my brother, and like suddenly I had less of a problem, and that was also, you know, it would make us closer, right, and more effective. Um, and so... There was elements like that and elements of giving yourself some redundancy so you could actually, you know, like actually have a real life and you yeah. know, avoid the loneliness of being kind of a startup CEO. But also it had it had a whole lot of kind of benefits to the way we were thinking and the way we were interacting with the business, and, you know, just not going down one track. And so we decided like, hey, if this is working, why don't we just sort of take a shared leadership model and expand it across the business? So we have, um, you know, we have shared leadership of um, of engineering, um, mm. you know, which works tightly with with our um, product leadership. We have shared leadership in in customer, um, and y- you know, you'll you'll have people who have kind of nuanced skills. So within customer, Katie is is much more focused on the more traditional customer success elements and how you really build impact in accounts. Um, Luke, who's uh, in that role as well, he's got more of a focus on the kind of traditional selling part of of, of customer, and you know, yeah, so those those skills work together. So, so we were expanding this idea of. So of, why not just call them sales manager and success yeah, manager? Yeah, it's, it's a really good it's a really good question um, because what you actually want is you want them to work together. Like, yeah. yeah. So if, if you look at our sales model, our sales model is very much one of, like I said, we're trying to get. The customer to understand impact quickly, yeah. and so, you know, to, to sell it, you need to have the customer stories, which typically come out of customer success. Likewise, we try to get to pilot very quickly. We try to get to people, get people to get a taste of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and when they get a taste of it, well, that's that's really delivered by what would traditionally be called customer success people. Yeah. But likewise, those customer success people who are dealing with with your know, clients, they're actually finding more opportunities. They're they're tracking the diaspora from accounts, like all of those sort of things. So we just wanted it to work. Yeah, work as a whole, um, and so um, yeah. To extend that idea, you know, then we we were like, you know, obviously we want to extend what we're doing in the collective as well, right? And so we, um, you know, Ruby joined us in the collective, and she, you know, has, it, your collective is what you call it. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, you, we're not the, the three EO. That's Sharesies, man. Like, so like, um, <laughs> like, so we're the collective, and like, and yeah. and that's you know, that's um, uh, been super refreshing because she comes to it with um, her her own lens, um, yeah. you know, and. 
gosh, we challenge each other, but also at the same time, we um, yeah, we're very good at kind of coalescing around the right thing to do, um, mm. and yeah, and not being not being overly complex. You know, making sure that we have a, a simple selection of messages which we which we want the business yeah. to understand are important to us, and um, yeah, and look, I'm going on uh, you know like a, a holiday now, and I can you know, yeah. So. A testament to her, right? So as a co-CEO joining a collective of two brothers and two, mm-hmm. you know, two dudes, you know, yeah. like fucking big role to jump into. Yeah, yeah. And look, like 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 that's that's part of, of the magnificence of, of Ruby, right? It's just this ability to actually kind of like not be overawed by anything really. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure privately she has, you know, those things which scare us because we all have things that scare us. But like, yeah. um, you know, certainly she's been able to come in there and, and – um. Uh, yeah, being completely willing to to challenge us, and, I, and hopefully that's part of what we've got right in the culture is that yeah. Yeah, we do we do not always get it right, but we do strive to create a psychologically safe environment where yeah. Yeah, people can have ideas and challenge things and so on. Uh, yeah. yeah, and is that from confidence again of like doing it before and being? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I think that certainly from my perspective, yeah, I spent some time being CEO of Sonar Six and sometimes sometimes not like just um in, in the sort of uh the curve of that business but yeah at the end i was the ceo and doing that that deal um to be acquired and um you know it kind of sucked yeah. like i think that like i felt that like yeah you just sort of get beat up on from every angle like like no one's ultimately happy there's lots of stresses that you just don't really get to share it's lonely. And, um, yeah and um and i think that um I just didn't want to do that again so yeah. as, as much as anything it was a matter initially of just avoiding that but I, I don't want that to be the kind of main message because the main message is it's fucking awesome. That yeah. Actually, it's more the positives rather than avoiding the negatives that makes it so good. Yeah. You know, and that that um, you know, the f- you, you don't second guess yourself when you're in a group of three. I think the other thing too is if you, you know, there's there's an expression, isn't there, in engineering, which is um, never go to sea with two chronometers. Mm. You know, go with one or go with three. Mm. It's kind of a little bit like that, right? Like um. You know, like if you've got two people with different opinions, then it's hard to solve for, right? Yeah. If you've got three people, there's typically an outcome. Yeah. And do you have the ability to better make decisions in isolation? Oh, of course, right? I mean, like, like this is the this is the thing between the three of us. We have just incredibly deep trust in each yeah. other, which will be the same with anyone that works in a co leadership role within within Joyous. And so, I think that that um, yeah, that piece is important. We tend to just allocate allocate things to people so if there's i don't know if there's uh, certain things we're working on in salary reviews or something like that then someone yeah. will take that and you'll yeah. just trust that person to do it you know, yeah. um, uh, when it comes to things like um you know setting the setting the strategic direction for the for the coming year that's clearly a collective decision yeah yeah you know? And does it does it does the need for like a chief operating officer dissipate because of the collective that you have look um one of the things which happens with collective leadership is your span of control becomes massive all of a sudden, mm. right? So um, if you think about that that engineering piece, yeah, between Lisa and Kevin who head engineering, um, I'm not sure exactly of the size of their, their team. Let's just say it's like, uh, like 24 or something like that at the yeah. moment. I, I, don't, I don't know the number. Um, um, and that means that between the two of them, there's no real intermediate layer there there's definitely some senior people who who step up into into roles you know, which are more about mentoring people and lots of those responsibilities are shared you know, beautifully yeah. within that team but from the perspective of kind of where the buck stops it's not like you actually need to have an intermediate layer because you've got two people and effectively the span of control of 10 or something each yeah. or whatever that kind of works right um and yeah you know, one of the things we have found is that like you know if you're if you report to to effectively two people you don't want to have Two, you know, two people in charge of your, you know, performance or yeah, any of those yeah. sort of things. So you two tend, different conversations. Yeah, that you could tend, be quite yeah, personal, you, right? You tend to have like kind of a single person who you you would generally have your one on ones with, but mm. then you'll have one on ones of other people, you know, from time to time and so on. Awesome. And so this is um, it's an interesting way of working, right? Like I've said, I've seen some people adopt in New Zealand now. Mm-hmm. Do you find that because you're in that you've been in the HR tech space that you're you're constantly thinking about organisational design and thinking about how you can improve it, and make it better? Yeah. Look, um, I, we said right from the beginning that if we were in if we were if we were starting a business where the kind of purpose we wrote on the wall was we want to make life better for people at work. Yeah. You need to start 
at Joyous. <laughs> you yeah. need to make sure that's a great place to work. And so we've always been willing to challenge the norms, right? Yeah. Um, work out. Yeah, we feel we have a strong license to experiment. Um, now, sometimes we'll get that right and sometimes we'll get that wrong, like undoubtedly, right? But, um, you know, I think that it's very much been a case of going, yeah, let, let's, let's experiment. But I want to be clear on something too, which is that I went to a talk from someone from, from you know, Facebook recently and I don't really, you know, I, I don't give um, Facebook a whole lot of credit, um, you know, as, as an organisation, but they were adamant that like, you know, Culture comes from the top down. It doesn't come from the bottom up. But, you, know, you, you actually have to set culture at the top of the organisation and it works its way down. It's just f- bullshit. Yeah. You know, like if I look at, at Joyous, all the things which are great about Joyous come from the bottom up. They come from... But is that because you know, you've given them psychological safety from the top to be able to have those opinions? I, I, yeah, so I yeah. think it's both, right? Like yeah. it's in order for them to feel confidence to be able to give you the information or give you ideas and things, mm. they need to have that psychological safety that that's a trustful environment. Yeah, I mean, and, and not wanting to get kind of too sort of, um, you know, in, 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 into the terminology, but yeah. I think that like you'll find that sometimes the values of an organisation should should come from the top. Like we have a yep. founders charter, which we've 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 really stuck to about yeah how we're trying to design a business. That What's the sort of, founders charter for people listening that they don't know? Oh uh, well, for, for, well <laughs> I don't know if this is a common term, but for us the founders charter charter is really just a list of kind of the immutable things which we want to always be true. Yeah. Right. Um. So. Uh, you know, we don't want to build an organisation that over time changes to become something that that Philip and I weren't trying to build initially. Yeah. Now. That's really extended over time, particularly as our leadership's grown out and as people like Ruby have joined into that conversation and so on. But that is that that piece of the values is a bit more top down, and so psychological safety really is is kind of part of the value. Yeah. Um, now I want to I want to be clear about this too. That th- those are things which are they're actually quite tough things to achieve, right? They're, they're quite you know giving people the 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 I guess the license to be able to you know. Um, or, or the trust that that their their commentary will be accepted always, and that mm. like, that, that you know that people will give them the benefit of the doubt. Y- you know, you actually have to actively work on that stuff. And sometimes, like I said, sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we get it wrong. But I hope that those values do translate into this environment where we can go, hey, you know, like parts of our culture, um, you know, you know, our culture grows from the bottom up, and we go, oh, there's parts of our culture which we want to work on. We want to make better. Yeah. There's parts of our culture which we want to reinforce, and they're not sort of viewed as things that are a. Yeah, the, the mandate of some distant HR department or something that it's yeah. actually literally you know, all of us kind of kind of collectively reaching that, and um and I I do I, I do want that to be the case you know even when we're a larger organisation you know when you're around fifty people or so like we are it's you know it seems eminently achievable but like when you, you get to uh, what. What's that terminology when you get to 150 something? I can't remember the term where everything changes and yeah. leadership comes in. And yeah, yeah. I mean, look. We, we, to be honest, we we believe we can grow very large with 100 staff. You yeah. know, like there is that thing of yeah, you know, that traditional idea of you just have to keep adding adding body bodies and say sales because that's the scalable unit. I think that's that's starting to shift. You know, like like we're moving to a an economy where efficiency is 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 valued, yeah. Yeah, you know, probably even above growth. You yeah, know? and so we need to actually start working out how you become really productive on a small team. Now, the advantage of that is that you can maintain culture much more easily. Yeah, you know, like yeah. how do you? I'm re- I'm really interested to go deeper on this, right? Because we are in an era now where, unfortunately, people aren't older blokes like us that have been through variations of recessions and seen a bunch mm-hmm. of things. And so the world that they know is only uber fucking high growth startup. You yeah, know, in the last three years, what would you say to people listening to this that we're saying like, hey, we're resetting a little bit now. It's going back to the older days where you have to be efficient, you have to be building good product mm-hmm. and focusing on, you know, maintaining operational excellence and financial excellence. What advice would you give to someone? Yeah, look, I think that it's um, anyone that raised capital in the, in the boom years is currently growing into their valuation. That's like the yeah, yeah that's yeah. the that's the terminology. And really understanding what that means is interesting, right? Because, um, you know, for, for a company like Joyous, effectively our multiple 
that we raise money at has gone down. So yeah. where we might have raised money at 20 times ARR, let's say now it's 10 times ARR. And in fact, yeah, the reality of it is it's probably more aggressive than that, the, the contraction. Um, and so effectively, in that example I gave of 20 and 10, to grow into your valuation, now I need to be at double the revenue, right? Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, is that you'll find that, that lots of organisations can't actually double their revenue on the, the current rate of burn, right? Yeah. So the way which they used to grow and the money they would invest to get to, to doubling their revenue, well, by the time they get to double their revenue, um, they've run out of cash. Mm. And in, in, in the previous world, the importance was how fast can I get to that doubling my revenue? That was, everything was just focused on the speed with which you could grow. But um, if you take this kind of current perspective where there's a more existential lens to it, like actually you want to get yourself into a position of almost break-even optionality where you're like, of course you can continue to grow because you can continue to exist without yeah. getting more cash on board. And um, that, mindset resh that mindset shift I think that most people did it pretty quickly. Of course, they fucking had to. Yeah, you know, yeah. that was the reality of it. Yeah, it was yeah. the reality for every business I'm involved in, really. It's like, okay, you need to actually now get into a mode of going, okay, if we want to, if we want to do a growth round ever again, we're going to have to do that on the current cash. And to do that, yeah, you need to be efficient. And so I think there used to be this thing, which was if you look at burn ratios, and burn ratio is one of my favorite things, which is how much money you burn, um, you know, to, to grow your ARR in yeah. a SaaS business. And so, um, you know, if you, if you add a add million dollars of, of ARR and it costs you $2 million to do it, you've got a burn ratio of two, right? Yeah. And a burn ratio of two used to be kind of acceptable. In fact, like you could survive with a burn ratio of two and a half or three. Yeah, because it's just you know, constant raising. Off the yeah, back constant of those, right? raising. Mm. Burn ratios now, they're not about being at one. They're about being well below one. Yeah. That, like actually, you know, the last raise that Joyous did, we have to treat it like it's the last raise we will ever do. Now, of course, that's not the reality, but that's that's the level of kind of preciousness that you need to treat treat this, and that should that should drive you know the the way you make decisions on um, you know, where you invest and and all of those sorts of things. Um, that you have a you know a constant kind of ROI focus and a constant focus on the fact that when you uh, burning cash, that is effectively using up investment and that investment is a finite pool. Mm. And how do you, like you, is, is, do you feel that that is resonating as much with you on the companies that you sit across? Like yeah. Look, I think that the interesting thing is, is that like companies like Joyous, which raised in you know, the end of the year before last, right? Yeah. We, we raised in the boom. Yeah. The danger actually is that like, oh, we've got plenty of cash in the bank and we don't change our behavior. You know, but, but that money yeah. runs out pretty quickly if you keep yeah. operating the way you were, That's right? That's exactly right. So, But there's more danger for those companies versus, say, the companies where they were planning on raising the middle of last year and suddenly they can't yeah. because they sort of had, like, something forcing their hand. And honestly, every every business I look at like that has become more efficient. Their marketing function has become more yeah. efficient. Their, their product um, engineering function has become more efficient because maybe they've got less team but they still have to get the same amount of stuff out and so on. You kind of You kind of realise that, the competition has changed. And mm. so for a company like Joyous, in the past we were worried about that super well-funded competitor that would come out of nowhere that had raised $30 million on Santal Road and was like going to pass our technology. Honestly, what you've got to worry about is like scrappy companies that are just working harder and smarter on, you know, on strict resources. Yeah. Um, and you know, you've got to get yourself into that mindset. You've got to get yourself into that world of operating. And that's, you know, something which is you know bottom to top. You know, everyone in the organisation has to has to do that. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a bloody good time to be in Kiwi business, right? Because mm -hmm. we're able to do things so much more effectively with a smaller amount of people. Yeah, and it's been harder competing against the Americans who can come in mm -hmm. two years later than you and throw a hundred million dollar raise at their first Series A yeah. and just dominate, right? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, look, I mean, I've I've always had a lot of faith in what we can do down here based on on you know. I, I guess mentality and, and that thing um, of you know being scrappy and working yeah. working with what you've got, um, and yeah, I think it does. Does, it, it does, does that hold us back though at times? Oh, uh, maybe. I mean, yeah, I spend a, a bit of time with different companies, and I've often heard this thing of like, oh yeah, what what New Zealanders are lacking is they're lacking ambition. It's just not even slightly true. All New Zealanders have got tons of ambition. Um, yeah, you know, the challenge we've had is that. 
you know, sometimes it's actually quite hard to build past a certain point. So in, in Sonar 6, you know, like just the nature of that, that, that business and the nature of the way that capital worked in New Zealand and so on meant that we kind of had to sell it because if you were someone like me who had founded it, I mean, I couldn't afford to fix my fucking car, yeah. but I've got like this, this wealth there. And in the US, I would have bought on a VC which would have released some of that wealth and my life would have got better because I was six years into what was a very successful business. Yeah. Um, whereas here, it was like still like a, you know, like a, a, a kind of coin toss as to whether I would get, get anything. And so it's, it's almost a structural problem to me rather than you know, a, an ambition problem holding us back. How do we fix yeah. that? Well, uh, look, I think it's fixing itself to an extent in that, like, yeah, we've obviously got more capital in the market now. Yeah. We've got more VCs willing to do that. But we're still struggling to build out real you know, general partner experience and build out real markets for, I guess, secondary stock in, in companies like Joyous. So, yeah. so they end up in this position where, you know, all of those employees with ESOP don't have any liquidity. The founders don't have any liquidity. You know, you're, you're really relying on... Um, on yeah, some kind of liquidity event, and yeah. no one's IPOing anymore. Yeah. If you if you look at Joyous, we're not. Um, yeah, I said it. We're not. We're not raising capital anytime soon. So all of the things which might actually create an environment where there's some liquidity aren't there. So um, whereas whereas you know in the US there's a lot of kind of secondary funds and ways of, yeah. of making that work, and you know it's kind of so some of that practice maybe needs to change. But I would just say the trajectory is is right. We're just we're just catching up with the world. Yeah, and I think the maturity of the – I mean, it has been deal fever over the last three years, right? We've mm. had so many companies that have been acquired that have seen liquidity. And so you see, like, the dopamine effect of share options for – when mm. I'm, a, as a recruiter, negotiating someone's contract now and I go, and there's ESOP, they go, well, fuck yeah, you know, where, mm. where two years ago they'd be like, oh, lottery ticket, you know. Yeah. And so I think it's the confidence of that and the, the fact that that money is going back out into the ecosystem and the confidence of the people is going back out into the ecosystem mm. is helping to do that. Yeah, but, no, absolutely. Mm. Well, I mean, it, it, the, the thing that I always come back to is if you actually look at companies founded by New Zealanders that have kind of grown to a billion dollars in a sh you know, shorter period of time, I think you'll find, and I, I, this is anecdotal, but like, you know, Lanza Tech, A2 Milk, Zero, all birds, I mean... Weather. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you, you compare that. You can probably build a list of 10 of them pretty quickly in your head. Yeah. You compare that with Australia and you've got like, you know, Culture Amp, Atlassian, Canva. It's about the same size list. Mm. You know, and like they've got five, six times the population, right? We definitely have that ability to... Oh, rocket Labs. Yeah. I mean, come on, there's like some dude firing rockets into space. You know, like it's like... Yeah. You know, yeah. like this is... That, that that thing where you ever kind of like question the ambition of New Zealanders, that's the that's the answer. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, largely that's what we're trying to do with the podcast, right, is say there's so many fucking heroes here. Mm. You know, you should be looking and listening to some of these people and, and listening to their voices and backing people to have these voices, to get these voices out into the market because they are so good. Mm, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because it's the first time I've actually thought about the difference between Australian billionaire like unicorns and... And New Zealand, and you think about it side by side, mm. per capita, punching New Zealand, good on you. Yeah, so, yeah. Where do you look for inspiration to enjoy us? Like, where do you, where do you say, look, that's that. This is where I go to find people and talk to people and learn. Yeah, look, look. Um, I, a lot of it's within the team, honestly. Like, I talk to, yeah, you know, sort of top to bottom in the organisation. Yeah, uh, I mean, I could just roll off names of people I kind of go to, like Alice or Kevin or Lisa or. Mark, or like, or, I mean, honestly, if I start naming names, I'll just end up naming yeah. the whole company. And they're all people where, like, I go and chat with them and I'm like, yeah, like, I'll instantly find something that I hadn't thought about and that'll stimulate the way you think and so on. So there's a lot of it, you know, is is inside, you know, inside the business. Um, yeah. You know, and, and obviously I've mentioned how, you know, Ruby and Philip and I work together and how that's yeah. stimulating. I think when, um, when it comes to, um, you know, going outside of the business, we've been quite fortunate in that, that, yeah, we've got three VCs on the the, the register, um, and all three of them are around the, the board table, and we've got good relationships with all of them. And so that who, gives who us are the VCs? Uh, Square Peg, Airtree, and Ice House Ventures. And oh. um, and yeah, between between the three of them, there's lots and lots of muscle memory and lots of um yeah lots of uh, um, I guess uh, yeah understanding particularly of capital markets and those pieces and and yeah for me personally I mean, I, I've done a few other boards and so yeah with um I guess 
you know, Founders Fund, Nexus, Blackbird, you know, I've kind of touched a lot of those folk. And so yeah. that's, that's one place because there's lots of pattern matching and understanding of, of how these businesses become kind of, um, you know, what, what typically makes a successful company. Um, I think that, um, you know, beyond that, I just love talking to entrepreneurs. You know, there's just like so many great entrepreneurs, both in New Zealand and in, and in Australia. And, you know, we get good access to them through, often through the VCs or through other things. And, like, yeah. you know, and you'll just... Yeah, like l learn stuff about you know, what people are trying that's new and so on. And so, yeah, I mean, just as as an example, recently, you know, we've been um, yeah, really really seeing what application we can have of um, of uh, Copilot, you know, like the the Chat GPT driven coding tools for um, for GitHub, and you, you know, like both within the business and joy us as people experimenting with that and you know, I've talked about it and then and I've talked to you know other other entrepreneurs and other CTOs and so on and you kind of like just you know if you didn't do that you wouldn't accelerate quickly yeah. you know if you sort of um you know like you wouldn't you wouldn't find the tips and tricks would you yeah and that's that's something that I think you know like uh, I f I feel like we need to do more of right like and and for for companies that I guess what I'm trying to say is because there's going to be less VC funding right there's less VC mm. activity and networking events and the likes because mm. of that by association because we're probably not wooing as much in terms of mm. looking to give our money out um I'm speaking to so many founders at the moment who feel isolated, who don't have the networks, and they ask me, who should I speak to? Can you put me in touch with someone who should mentor mm. me and the likes? And so I'm always interested to hear how people that have done it before, where did they get their information when they're at a problem that they can't solve internally? Yeah. And so We just need one big-ass Slack group for all entrepreneurs yeah, in New Zealand, yeah. don't we? Yeah, like, it just does my head in that, like, yeah, I, um, I was saying this to, like, I met with, um, caught up with Grant, Grant Straker, and um and uh, Imche um in, in Wellington as part of a, a thing and I was like I think I've only I've only met both those folk in in Wellington yeah and we all live in Auckland yeah like it's like yeah this this piece of yeah Auckland really now is the center of of tech in New Zealand now, yeah, I'm, not, I, so I'm not saying as that, a Wellingtonian I agree yeah, right yeah I'm not yeah. saying that there's not good stuff happening elsewhere yeah. but if you look at it even even per capita it's it's outperforming other other yeah. towns. But you, know, you go back to that that heritage of you know, maybe two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight in Wellington, where it was like you know, all of those people were coming together, and it was yeah. like a, you know, there was a sense of community around tech. We've never had that in Auckland, right? And well, so, well, even know, if you you don't have like the, I was talking about with David Downs earlier, right? Like you don't really have the um, the Creative HQ hub here, mm, or the mm, Ministry of Awesome, or mm, you don't have like there's little pockets and things like. Yeah. But I think there's a real gap in the market in Auckland for that. It's interesting, like so. Um, I lived in Sydney for a lot of last year, and um, and you know, in New South Wales, they're really trying to build this sort of like connection between these suburbs, from sort of, I guess, um, Erskineville through to to um, Surrey Hills, where yeah. that's where all of the co-working spaces and all of the Surrey VCs Hills is pretty and, much, and that's yeah, yeah, that's where they're all going. And like you'll find it, and it, yeah, it's got you know, University of Sydney in there. It's got like. Um, yeah, they're building a co-working space apparently of seven thousand square meters. Is that like, in the new so, around the Atlassian campus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, you know, so like this is like um, that's like that is sort of stuff that will stimulate yeah. you, all of the evidence. Like you know, um, if you read the startup genome project, all of the evidence says that like kind of spaces where you create connection um, really do help. But what I would also say though is that like let's not forget that the trend. Is, a, is is not just away from co-working, it's away from offices, right? Yeah. So that that is a thing which says that, like, hey, you know, businesses like Joyous are doing very well with, you know, both an in-office culture and a, a um, you know, remote culture. And so there's no reason, really, that you shouldn't be able to build a build a remote kind of ecosystem as well. Yeah. Right? I, I don't know how you do it. But, Does remote you know, only work for people? Um, I mean, uh, let me phrase this again. Is remote only good for people that have already developed those connections and networks and learning by osmosis? Like, are the mm. younger generation missing out on? Look, I, I, I can tell you from a perspective of what we've observed with engineering, right? Yeah, like yeah. The, the the real hub of invention within a within a SaaS business. Um, you know, I think that the engineering and product team, if they're not in office a big chunk of the time, they're just not as inventive. They don't. Yeah. They don't yeah, you know, they don't support each other as much. Like I think that you get much better outcomes having an, an office culture. Yeah. Um, 
you, you complement that with a work from home culture as well, though, because that has well known benefits too, right? It has that ability to to concentrate and so on. I think if you just have all of one or all of the other, you're missing the yeah you know, you're missing the opportunity yeah. at the moment, right? And so um, I would I would say that that I've always struggled with this idea of completely remote businesses, like how they actually build a culture. Do they have a real culture? Do they have do they have those really deep connections where like you know if we talk about psychological safety, I'm I absolutely know as a human being you know, whether I've actually pissed this person off or not or, you know, like yeah. you know, those things which really you tend to be much better at in person than you do over Zoom. Yeah, I agree completely. Like I, hybrid for me is the future, right? Like good hybrid. But um, I know so many people that are in complete remote roles and have never felt more scared about their job at all times. They don't mm. know how to read the culture and feel of their company because yeah. it's behind a screen all the time. I can, I can totally imagine that, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, I can, I can, I can feel... Yeah, I've certainly felt loneliness within the corporation when I used to work in, in enterprise roles, and um, you know, and uh, that was just because my boss was in a different country. Yeah, and so I was kind of, you know, and I just could not tell really what my relationship was, you know, what how that piece worked. Um, and so I think that yeah, it's valid. I think that like if you if you think about it, I mean, you know, I, I think that that work is about teamwork yeah. for most people. The work is the, the bit about work which is good as the people. Yeah. You know, like 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 yeah, we work hard, but yeah, we achieve things. You, you know, like there's a lot of yeah, a lot of people that like that, right? And um and that that involves involves hanging out, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I did, right? And I think I think the real challenge with the remote working now is that for the people that commute, they're mm. like, "Well, fuck, I don't want to come back to work." Yeah, yeah it's, it's a long time, and I get that, right? Like, yeah. Oh. But but yeah, you know, it's just like you got to just do a hybrid, right? And I think you'll end up with places like yeah, you know, like, I don't know, like the Beehive and Smells Farm. Like maybe maybe that would be a place where some people from Joyous go to, yeah, some people hub. go elsewhere. Yeah. And, yeah, and um and look look like while I'm doing this this podcast, I'm missing Samia's um, baby shower back at at Joyous. Well. Yeah, you can have a baby shower over Zoom, but like you know, it's like a it's a reason for people yeah. to come together, isn't it? Yeah, you know, like yeah. so, I am um, and yeah, you know, and share some love and joy and and those things which are human things which are done best together. So yeah. I, look, I think the great companies will have a will we'll work out the mix. Yeah, and I think it's like a pendulum, right? Anything, anything you think about in today's society, whether it be like politics ideology you know we're it's all coming somewhere to a nice place where we can all agree that's uh, yeah we can all agree yeah i don't think we can all agree is the thing that, no, that well, we can but, all get behind <laughs> but, um, but yeah. i've um i've like i mentioned I, I lived in sydney last year and um and part of what i loved about living in sydney was actually that i got to work in the little little sales offices we have in sydney um with yeah with a couple of people there and um the Michaels, because they're both called Michael. I'm also called Michael, so there's three <laughs> Michaels in the office. And um, and um, but that was like that was great because it was, yeah, you know, it was just I looked forward to spending time with that little team. Yeah. So it's not like I need to be in some big office. It's just I need to have some human interaction and uh, be connected, so, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. There's... So so like a like a like a little hub with four of our team in it. It's fine too. Yeah. What made you move to Australia? Oh, look. Um, if I'm candid. Can I be candid? Yeah. <laughs> if I'm candid, it was just like I just um, had cabin fever after being locked in in Auckland yeah. for um you know for for so long, um, yeah. and so it was like I just needed to do somewhere different and um needed to go somewhere where we could take the dog, um, yeah. and um Sydney is Beautiful Sydney was spot. easy, yeah. but um but also it was glorious. I loved it. I mean, it rained every day because that was Sydney last year. But like yeah. um but you know, just uh yeah you, know, you sort of think of Australia as being not the most adventurous choice, do you for um for going somewhere? But like, yeah, like coming home from from work every day and having different streets to walk down was what yeah. I kind of needed post pandemic I think yeah I'm, I'm an Aussie and so I, uh, it's a it's a diverse country Australia people mm. talk about you know it's not adventurous but I'm like well travel around it's pretty mm. it's pretty different to New Zealand yeah um but yeah it's it's an interesting time we're living now because we're now like we're gonna see probably more and more of the brain drain from New Zealand than we've ever seen before especially mm. with Australia opening it up saying hey mm. we're gonna treat you as actual first class citizens now <laughs> you know like mm. you can become a citizen and people are after COVID now are still moving right yeah and so people are, um I, a lot of companies reach out to me and say oh it's a little bit easier to hire people now and I'm like well not really mm. but let's you know let's see how it goes I mean definitely like the, the advantage yeah, for us, like let's say we're hiring, uh, you know, customer people in the US. A lot more people who are 
good, high quality people have become, I don't know, what's the recruiting phrase, loose in the socket. You know, yeah. like they've, they've started to look around where they might not have before and so yeah. on. So that ability to find unique talent is, has definitely improved. I think what we're finding in New Zealand and the, and the challenge which we're, we're, we're trying to work our way through and we haven't solved it at Joyous is that, yeah, we employ lots of people in their mid-20s and, um, and it's like we've, yeah, that traditional thing of I'm going to do an OE at some point in that phase of my life. We've kind of like smushed that all into <laughs> into yeah. like one year out of four sort of thing, yeah. and so um, yeah, we're working out ways we can give opportunities for people into um, you know, uh, you know, our office in Amsterdam. You know, can they go and work there? You know, those sorts of things. Now, you know, that's not a universal um, you know, benefit, but like we are we are getting more more active on going. Okay, how do you actually create an environment where young Kiwis can kind of travel but not become part of the brain drain? Yeah, but um, but I'd, I'd like to position something else though, which I'm seeing too. Which is, I, that's good and bad in my opinion, right? Because yeah. you also, if you if they love working at Joyce and you let them go for two years, they might go off and learn something fucking really amazing and come back to you. Oh no, absolutely yeah. right. And and, we, and that's why I said we're sort of like we're sort of working out the the, yeah. the policy and how it applies. So yeah, there's someone recently who's who's left who's going to do a year of travel around Europe. I mean, I think our best case scenario is that, like, maybe in two or three years' time, they come, they come back yeah. and, and join us. Um, I think that, like, um, yeah, there's an interesting effect happening too, though, right? Because everyone thinks about, yeah, they think about the border mm. a lot when they think about, um, yeah, the brain drain, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, if I look at, at engineers that have left Joyous, we've had engineers that have left us to go and work for. An Australian startup or work for an established US company, and neither of neither of them have left their bedrooms. You know, yeah, they're yeah. still they're still here in, in New Zealand, um, and that sort of thing. Where um, actually in tech, kind of there is no border already. Yeah, it's you know, more like, time zone borders, right? Like yeah, a hundred percent, right? The time yeah. zone time zone kind of sucks. Yeah, you know, like that's what keeps people here. <laughs> so, yeah, but, like, yeah. but um, but that thing of um, that's an interesting thing from an economic perspective because. If you think about the tech economy in terms of employers, that seems like a bad thing. But if you think about the tech economy in terms of employees, mm. of individuals working, actually we've suddenly got this ability to, if you get training and development right, you can produce more and more capable engineers and product people and so on and so forth who can kind of work remotely. They all become little exporters, don't they? They're all learning foreign exchange. They're all like, yeah. um, you, know, um, you know, and that, that you know, I, I talked before about, you know, the office environment and so on, but let's let's be straight. There are some people who much prefer that. You know, yeah, that's what they want to do. And so I think that we should. Um, you know, we, we get really tied up on the, the idea of the border yeah. know, when it comes to the brain drain and so on. But there's no border in tech. Yeah, I I agree with you, and it's it's actually been really cool to see that. I mean, that was one thing interesting thing about COVID, right? Was that when COVID hit, people were home using technology a lot more. Companies were hiring like they've never hired before to keep up with demand of products that were growing. Mm. And then they started looking at New Zealand and saying, fuck it, let's just go remote now. Yeah. And, you know, Kiwis are starting to realise now that they can take some of these jobs globally, right, where they're good enough to be able to take jobs at Google and Atlassian and wherever, yeah. you know, mm. maybe. And so mm. it was really interesting seeing engineers' LinkedIn titles change overnight to, you know, f fang company, you know, and so. It's, um, it's, it's crazy to me if you look at, like, um, employers of record or, or um, PEOs in the US. Like, I can literally go in there and go um, – Okay, hire a person in New Zealand for me. Mm. In twenty minutes, like the shell company is set up, there's like a you know, way of employing the person. You know, like all of their contracts are done, et cetera, et cetera. Like in twenty minutes yeah. from the US, hiring someone. New Zealand's going to be one of the easiest countries to start a business, though. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, of course. But like, which is good. But like, it does mean that like here yeah, we are, we are creating an environment where this is a very easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, and I look, I'm. We've got to embrace it. It's, it's absolutely positive. What you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you increase the pipeline of of people entering tech and you increase the pipeline of people entering tech in two vectors, right? Like one yeah. of the vectors is you you, you, you make the courses shorter so you, you're happy taking people out of Inspiral Dev Academy and you know, yeah. you've got ways of ramping them quickly rather than them spending three or four years at university. And I'm, I'm not bagging on university because that produces great people too. Um, but also, yeah, you've got to solve for diversity. You know, yeah. You've got to get it so that Maori and Pacifica people are you know, joining tech and more women are joining tech because that will double the size of your pipeline. Yeah. And if you do that, 
and then you allow some of them to kind of just work for overseas companies, like I said, as their own little exporters, and you get some of them you know, in New Zealand companies and building, like, I, you know, we can worry less and less about the border then, can't we? Yeah, I agree, I agree. And with the whole remote working thing too, right, we can get out to communities and people can have mm. jobs in, in regional communities much easier than yeah. they could before. And yeah. so, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely an exciting time for tech. You know, like I was, as I said, I was talking to David before when I was saying to him, you know, how quickly or how fast are we away from like agriculture versus technology, you know, in terms mm. of exporting now? And I think it was like 3 billion and 30 billion, you know, right. tech being 3 billion, et cetera. Mm. And so, but- um, Well, have we passed, did we pass tourism? Like, yeah, I think so. Yeah yeah. 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 And I think it's interesting in that um, it's, we're not looking at tech now as just SaaS, like there's mm. physical products now. Yeah. Yeah. Again. yeah well, that, that list I mentioned before, you know, like, um, you know, like Lanza Tech and Rocket Labs and, you know, like- that's the thing I love is there's just so much proper, you know, deep science invention going on in this country. Yeah, I um, yeah, I, I think there's there's so much to be said about that number eight why can, you know Kiwi ingenuity, mm. and then there's like the for the positives and also for the negatives in terms that we tend to just tinker away and fix things ourselves mm. when we could mm. outsource it to someone and go faster. Um, what do you what have you seen in terms of the differences between New Zealand businesses and American businesses, and what have you taken from the states and probably kept? Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, I think that, that the the fundamental different difference is the um, is the one you were sort of leaning into there, right? Which is um, specialists versus generalists, right? Yeah, yeah we're a, we're a country of generalists, um, and and that is that is great for invention. That that is really is great because, like, you know, you can you can afford to be kind of multidisciplinary and take your engineering ideas and apply them to marketing, or you know, and so on. Whereas, like. You know, in, in the US, the idea that you kind of specialise in a particular area, you become, you kind of understand all the arcane details of, of drip marketing or something. Yeah, you know, that's a, yeah, that's niche. a yeah, that's a, that's a thing. And so I think that that's like, um, it's like to your sort of phrase before, it's good and bad. You know, like you, you, you definitely means that we can kind of move fast and we can kind of create things out of nothing and we can be very generative. Yeah. Um, but also then it means that do we actually have that expertise to compete at the very highest level, mm. you know, because once you get to the very highest level, you need that kind of expertise. And so you need to have some kind of mixture of those philosophies. Um, I would say that there is this, uh, there is a sense in the US, particularly in all of entrepreneurship, not just in tech, that like everyone's striving to be a billionaire, you know, like there is this sort of weird thing where like, yeah, over here you might open up an independent restaurant and then you might pass it to your kids and you might be really happy with that and you have a great lifestyle yeah. and um and you build something which people really value in your neighborhood. It's less common in the US. You know, like I'm opening a restaurant as the first restaurant of my chain of fifty restaurants yeah. or my franchise of restaurants or the three know. Bs are at the beach batch and yeah. BMW or whatever yeah. it is mentality in New yeah. Zealand. But yeah, is yeah. That, that but that's Americans in fucking general, right? Like sports mm. players, you know, they have this inner belief that they are going to be the best or whatever it may be at their thing. I was I was laughing about this just last week. I went to a, a into a, a sort of entrepreneurs conference and there was someone talking and like, yeah, the, the person next to me was Australian. And they just said to me like, yeah, like isn't it incredible how how Americans just say stuff with so much confidence and it makes yeah. you sort of like. Makes you, oh yeah, I kind of agree with that. And the, actually, what they're saying is it's the same shit you say every day, just with a different accent. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that there is, you, you know, like you do definitely get quite, uh, I guess, jaded to sort of blind confidence. Yeah. You know, spending a lot of time in the US, not you know being down on people from the US, but I do see that that as a as a character trait that you see quite often. But the flip side of that is that you know absolutely like you know. Shooting for the stars is yeah. is totally cool. There's none of this horrible cultural cringe we have in New Zealand of like of chopping down tall poppies. You know, yeah. we did this analysis way back when we were at Sonar Six about about tweets um, and you know, what, what people said about us on 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 Twitter. Like analyzing Twitter is like that's a it's a bad idea. Yeah, you know, but, but we we did it anyway, and like we found about about something like ninety five percent of the tweets about. So our six were really positive. Five mm. percent of them were kind of negative. When we when we analyzed that five percent of negative tweets, eighty percent of them came from New Zealand. Oh, and wow. like and and a chunk of them were were other people that worked in tech companies just cutting you down just yeah. for no reason other than that's what New Zealanders do. And that's depressing. Yeah, you know, that's a that's a depressing thing. And I'm mean, hopefully that's starting to disappear. But I that idea so. of cutting people down because they're doing something is is the is the only thing which I could live without in this country, I think. Uh, look, and I've been, um, you know, a, a 
a bad version of that in the past, right? Like I've definitely like as a recruiter, you get these, you get constant flurry of information at all times about what good companies and what bad companies and that founder's dodgy and that founder's good mm-hmm. and the likes. And so, and I've taken some information that I've been given by the gospel and sort of written people off mm-hmm. or, you know, not given them the the support that they need from the community because they're starting a fucking business, right? Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. so I've definitely tried to change that about myself and, and uplift people now wherever possible and never... Um, knock someone down always mm. trying to help you know send the elevator back down make it easy for them to come back up as i've been saying mm. you know a lot on this podcast look um look I, I think everyone everywhere in the world has has their challenges i mean it's a very challenging time to live in the u.s for a lot of reasons mm. right um you know it's it's i mean they're all well-known reasons right and um and i think that that's um you know means that people deal with that stuff in different ways um i am always impressed with the level of optimism that um that certainly the Americans within our team have, you know, yeah. that, that they actually are, it's a good trait to be able to see through the current, current challenges and see yeah. where the opportunities lie and, and focus your efforts on that. Um, yeah, and now, look, I think New Zealanders are, are good at that too. Um, but like, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely like one of, the, one of the beauties of building a kind of global business is that you get to deal with people in different different places and, you know, different parts of the US and Australia and, and Europe, you know, in our case, where you actually get to find, you know, Little people, bits. people work differently and, you know, you've got to make a culture that and create a set of values that works for all of those people. Yeah, awesome. Hey, wisdom comes from everywhere. And so to nicely segue into, like, sharing a bit of wisdom from you, if I was going to wrap this up, this episode, by saying, all right, Mike's going to give you a real nugget about, you know, something that really motivated him, whether it be a book, whether it be a, a podcast, whether it be a movie, whether it be a, a, a conference you went to, a person, you know, what's mm. the one thing that you would say, this did something for me, you should check it out and we're going to pop it in the show notes down below. Yeah, and so look, I'm, I mean, you mentioned this to me when I was coming in and like, I, I, it's funny, I mean, I could list the books that I've I've admired and read, yeah. you know, like I read Amp It Up recently and it's, you know, it's like helps you think about like... Um, Second time Amp It Up's coming up. Yeah, oh, yeah, like, yeah. It makes you think about like you know, like the, the relentlessness of it and the fact that like you know, excellence is something that you do all, all yeah. the time. And there's the more philosophical, you know, like like um Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. There's yeah. those sort of books about quality and so on. But the problem is like I don't think any of them are kind of gospel. Yeah, you know? I think they're yeah. all things which just sort of stimulate you and so on. And then when I start to think about you know, being stimulated, I can definitely think about the conversations I've had which have stimulated me and, and a lot of those are just stimulation around purpose, right? Just as a side, but it's such a great one. I, I got the opportunity to talk to Peter Beck just at a dinner and I asked him why he, he got into you know, starting Rocket Labs because it's always fascinated me. Yeah. I've always really liked rockets. And, you know, <laughs> and I just love that. Yeah, I love that. It's a, it's a passion that you do, do something with. But if I think about myself and I think about like what I try and do to actually to actually really stay ahead of the invention curve is yeah. that I just try and get outside of tech a lot. That's mm. really what I do. Um, and you know, if, if I'm thinking about it purely from the perspective of trying to understand different ways of thinking or inventive ways of thinking, just go to a contemporary art museum. Go to, go to the Auckland Art Gallery. Go to any of these places and look at, like, look at the creative you know, talent within New Zealand or, or internationally or, or find yourself in, you know, in art Instagrams or you know, art books or whatever because there's this whole world of invention going on in that creative space which I find extremely um, stimulating. Um, you know, like, so the you know, uses of AI, I think you know, there was more, more uses of AI developing in contemporary art yeah. you know, five years ago than there was in, in SAS. You know, like um, you know, jumping on top of things and trying to drive, and that you know, relentless force of creativity is probably the place I go to. And so, I, I think it, uh, hopefully it's not a cop out, but uh, to me, it's like you just got to get outside of tech. You've got to just yeah. go and do some stuff, which is, you know, um, and my kind of go to is, like I said, I just, whenever I arrive in another city, you know, which I'm fortunate to do through work, I just kind of hunt out the the modern art museum. Yeah, I look to be honest, I'm an artist myself, paint, uh, canvas painter, and. Oh, nice. um, Art for me is something that will forever be a, like a, a window into someone's character of how they go about creating something out of nothing, mm-hmm. like how, where their mind is, where they're thinking, what emotions they're conveying and the likes. And so it's a, a vulnerability as a superpower for me. And if you mm-hmm. can get that out and just try. Yeah. And so it's the, the process. If someone's really stuck on something and I'll say to them, 
if you think, if you think about it as a paintbrush on a canvas for the first time, sometimes you just got to put your brush on the canvas and mm. then let it go and just start. And mm. so like, yeah, so there's so many great lessons across art. Yeah, I like that, man. Thank you. It's the, um, the thing I like about that question is everyone's answered it really differently and right. you know, there's no monopoly answer of this book is the book, you know. Well, it's, it's like Ray Dalio's principles. Didn't like, I, I remember going to, like, going to like the beach like one year, you know, um, down sort of you know, one of those popular beaches that Aucklanders go to. And I was like, literally walking on the beach and like about seven people were reading it. It was, yeah. like, it was, like, yeah, it was the book everyone read five years ago. <laughs> Mate, I, thought, I, I just thought everyone's going to say the hard thing about hard things, you know. Uh, you yeah, well, to... I, honestly, I was, I was downstairs on my way up, and I was like, "Oh, what book?" And I was, like, "Oh, the hard thing about hard things." It's like, "No, it's like, I, I mean, it's that. a good book, yeah. but yeah, yeah." yeah. I, I, one of the books I will mention the book because it is sensationally good in that in that space of talking about talking about art and um, and how that works, and it's very applicable to entrepreneurs and any creative person. Um, is a book by Stephen Pressfield called the um, the War of Art. Mm. I've almost got it around the wrong way. So it's not the Sun Shu book. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, absolutely worth, worth looking at because it just talks about um, the fact that great creators and great artists and great entrepreneurs just actually have to develop a discipline and a relentlessness. Yeah. And, um, and this, this idea that, you know, I, I forget who said it, but someone said once that, like, um, you know, um, that inspiration is for, is for amateurs, that, mm. that, that the professionals just show up and, um, and, and get to work. And that the the art is in the work. That is absolutely how it works. You, you know, as an artist, that like it's not about having inspiration and then painting. It's about starting painting. You know, and um and that's very much um, a thing that this leans into. Um, there's a, there's a, an interview with a famous author. I forget who it is. I'm, I'm, I'm bad at forgetting who says these things. Yeah, but yeah like, we can chase they, them up in the notes they, later. Yeah, they said um uh yeah someone said like does your muse you know, have to show up before you can write. And they were like, yeah, absolutely. I can't write without my muse. But fortunately for me, she shows up at 9 a.m. every morning. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I think that's the thing, right? Yeah. Like it is like uh, I don't think entrepreneurship is any different than a lot of creative pursuits is that the, the people who are really great, and I'm sure this is the same in sports and other things, are really the people that just show up and do the work. Mate, well, I think that's evident from you and what you've said today because so many times you've answered questions with your, I look internally and you've mentioned names of people in your team. Um you haven't been PR driven at all, marketing driven today. You've just been your authentic self and talked about your journey and the, the people that you're getting to share it with. And so thank you for that, mate. I appreciate oh. it. Well, it's been lovely to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Mike. That was a really fun podcast for me. I absolutely love just sitting across from someone and just having rich information sharing sessions. And, and that's exactly what Mike did. And so thank you so much for him for coming on. I'm really excited to see where Joyce continues to grow from now. And so, yeah, it's it's been an absolute privilege. Uh, as I said, I said at the start of the show, it's been an absolute privilege to do these podcasts. I've been so fortunate to be able to chat with some super interesting and amazing people. We've talked to people from the SaaS industry. We've talked to people from the games industry. We've talked to people from high growth tech in Christchurch to aerospace to software and hardware products it's been phenomenal and so i'm really looking forward to taking some time off now and relaxing and enjoying my end of season um, composure and hopefully a holiday and so this is your chance to jump on and subscribe right now follow us on spotify uh, subscribe on youtube follow us on whatever uh, podcast platform you're listening to right now or watching on because that's the only way to know when we're going to launch season three and we're going to go pretty big with season three with some big guests and and go hard and so until then thank you so much to everyone enjoy your time off the, um, the government mandated podcast break that we're taking now and see you on the next season this podcast is produced by john otaka from empire films